Hey everyone, so we just got done with uh, about a three and a half hour live stream. The point of the stream was to overclock the three partner model 3080 cards we have right now. It wasn't a review. We're not yet saying which cards the best or the worst because the reviews process is for each card a couple days of work. So what we were doing was sort of pre-binning the cards for this weekend coming up where Joe Staponzi from Bearded Hardware will be visiting and we're going to take at least one of these cards under liquid nitrogen for further overclocking. But along the way we talked about some of the cards, we talked about the quirks, the power offsets and some results, initial results for percent scaling and stuff like that between the Asus Tough, the EVJ FTW3 and the Gigabyte Eagle and this is going to be your quick recap if you want uh, a condensed version. Before that, this video is brought to you by ASUS and its X570 Crosshair 8 Hero, which is one of the motherboards we're using for our new GPU testing benches. We chose this board specifically for its overclocking capabilities and stable BIOS, and we're using it with AMD Ryzen CPUs for benchmarking. The Crosshair is tuned for overclocking, has a powerful VRM, and has good memory tuning support. Learn more at the link in the description below. All right, so starting off, there's a couple of quick points that uh, we made during the stream that are worth going over again. The, the biggest thing we talk about, at least in overclocking with these cards, is the power percent slider. And with video cards, especially on video cards, you have a, a limited amount of power that you are provided with which you can increase the clocks. So you need extra power to push enough, well, voltage, P equals IV. So uh, as you increase your, uh, your voltage requirement, as you increase your frequency, you're increasing the power requirement ultimately. And the problem with that is without any form of power slider, when you're stuck at whatever the VBIOS is stock, like the Gigabyte Eagle was, then you really end up with pretty limited overclocking headroom. And especially you'll end up with scenarios where you'll see the frequency a lot spikier in the benchmarks. So for example, uh, at a, an increased power target where you're no longer limited by power, but maybe VREL or something instead, you'll see a much flatter, oftentimes anyway, frequency line. And once you're power limited, depending on the workload of the application at that particular point in time, you'll see the frequency drop and rise, and that's undesirable behavior overall. So, uh, point of all this is when we were doing the stream, we looked at the power target offset for each card, and the biggest thing that we sort of reminded everyone was, people a lot of the time will complain about, well, this card has 125% power offset, this card has 110% offset, so 125% gives me more power than 110 does. But as a reminder, percentage, just like everywhere else uses a percentage, is uh, a factor against some base metric. And if you have a card using easy numbers that, say, has a, a power target of 100 watts and it's got 120% power target, you might be able to do 120 watts uh, as an option. Or if you have a card that starts at 115 watts and it's got a reduced power target, like maybe 10%, you can see how just doing a strict percentage it's not really telling you which card clocks higher or allows more power. Um, so that's all really basic stuff, but it is a common misconception I wanted to address it. Another thing that we talked about was the memory. So for the three cards, the one that performed the best was the EVGA FTW3. That is because we were able to pull the more, most power through this one. It's a three pin connector, but uh, we still will need to download a different VBIOS and install it to push the power a little bit further because we were ultimately still power constrained on this card. It still looks like it's from like a, a house of mirrors to me. Like if it's like I said in the stream, it's like it's getting all warped by some weird bendy mirror. But anyway, they perform the best. We can't fault it too hard. Um, so this card in particular uh, did have the highest power capabilities and therefore held the highest clocks. For the clocks we set out of the box, the FTW3 ran a Port Royal score of uh, 12,140 points. If that doesn't mean a lot to you, that's fine. You can use it relatively, comparatively. So the TOF did 11,845, and the Gigabyte Eagle did 11,777. That's based on the clocks they have out of box. That's full stock configuration, no modifications at all. And if we do quick relative scaling for, uh, well, what is that? What do those points really mean? Which is a completely fair question. 12,140 stock baseline on the FTW3 puts you 11, let's see, 11,777. Puts you 3%, 3.1% 3 ahead of the Eagle, the worst score stock. So you can see how the range isn't that crazy between these three cards. And what that really means is that, unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of overclocking headroom here tonight, but with liquid nitrogen and with VBIOS mods with higher power targets and potentially hard mods, Joe and I expect that we can push these a lot further. But for stock cooler overclocking, from what we've seen so far, you shouldn't be expecting huge gains, which is unfortunate because some previous cards like 1080 Ti's, 
it wasn't hard to get more than 10% performance increase with an overclock, or even more in a lot of instances with the better cards. Uh, so these have been limited thus far. As the higher-end custom boards come out, which they will, they're not really here yet, uh, this may change. Maybe we'll start seeing more, but it seems like there is uh, a, a very hard hit in diminishing returns as you approach that 380, 375-watt barrier. Even with the three-pin connectors, we start pushing 400, 420 watts. It's got this diminishing return that just hits super hard. And uh, that's unfortunate because NVIDIA was sort of saying that Ampere scales with power much better than previous generations, and it does. But so far, from what we've seen, that is primarily as related to the, uh, the stock power limits, not necessarily the overclocked ones. So it does sort of asymptote out as it hits the top. Uh, all right, so offsets, the FTW3, we settle on offset of 50 megahertz. It was stable in Port Royal and 500 for memory. Same thing with percent offsets, it's, it's an offset. So if the base frequency is higher, then 50 is, uh, is more meaningful than maybe 100 megahertz offset on a lower SKU card like the Gigabyte Eagle. So 50 for that. We were seeing about a 2050 megahertz peak core reading. We sometimes saw 2070, 2080, it never held though. So that seems to be about the range where these cards were peaking before they ran into stability issues or power limit issues or both. And memory offset 500 on FTW3, but the memory on our Gigabyte card appears to be pretty good. Uh, I still need to look into if any of these are pre-overclocked on the memory side. We didn't check into that tonight. Like I said, this isn't a review. Uh, we'll get there. We're not at that full depth yet. But the Gigabyte card allowed for a 900 megahertz memory offset, which was better than all the others so far, uh, unless it had a lower baseline. I need to check. The Asus Tough card had a 600 megahertz memory offset supported and 90 megahertz core. And uh, ultimately, the overclocked scores for all three of them, this is with fan speeds at 100%, so um, we're benefiting from the boosting algorithm where uh, your frequency will increase based on lower temperatures for every couple degrees. Final scores were 12.294 for the ASUS card, 12.460 for the EVGA FTW3, and 12.250 for the, uh, for the Eagle. So if we kind of look at these cards, really then, until obviously wait till we do the full reviews to really talk about this stuff, but uh, what you really need to be considering is stuff like quality of life improvements where you, you may have something to gain from focusing on more of a, uh, something that has like a better acoustic profile or something that has uh, looks that don't resemble, what was it our super chat person said? Someone in super chat said, uh, they called it Taylor Swift lipstick red or something like that. Someone else said it was clown colored red. I don't know. People hate this color is what we're getting at. Uh, fortunately, EVJ is doing options to get rid of this, um, this red where they're going to have black, silver, and a couple other options. But anyway, looks would be one thing to consider. Uh, size, of course, if you're working with AT micro ATX or ITX cases, that's going to be a huge consideration. But the point is, so far, we're not seeing a massive change from overclocking uh, accessibility as of today. But with the 20 series also, there were vBIOS updates later on in life that allowed the cards to clock a bit higher, pull more power, and uh, maybe get more out of it than you saw tonight. For uh, additional features, there's vBIOS switch. We ran the, nor the uh, OC mode. There's also a normal mode. So I'll put this down so we get a clean shot of it. But there's a vBIOS switch on at least two of the cars. I have to inspect the Eagle more closely. I don't see one on there. But um, we ran the performance mode for both of them. ASUS calls theirs performance and quiet. Uh, so if you don't know, a dual BIOS switch just means there's two BIOS profiles on there. It's written to firmware. And that'll typically be a quiet and an OC. And the outcome is that you're going to have a lower power target on the quiet one with a less aggressive fan curve because there's less power to deal with. So that's the difference. We ran the higher performing ones for everything tonight. And then the Gigabyte card, someone said, I haven't like really looked at this thing yet. This is the first time I was working with it. So this is all research that I had to do for the reviews anyway. And we just thought, well, we'll do it live and uh, people can see the full experience. But keeping all that in mind, and I haven't done a teardown on this, I do not see a dual BIOS. It doesn't mean there isn't one. I could be overlooking it, but I genuinely, I've looked everywhere it would normally be, and I don't see one. And someone said 
there's a hidden dual BIOS switch on it, and I'm pretty sure it was someone in chat trolling, or the message was lost, and they were talking about a different GPU. But I mean, we Andrew and I looked at this for a few minutes, and I don't see a dual V BIOS. So if I missed it, feel free to tell me where in the comments. But I'm sure it's going to be more like Steve. It's in the fourth dimension behind the third heat pipe on the left, and then I'll know that I need to get a device that can bend space and time to find it. So yeah, that was the, the results for the stream. The FTW3 I was pretty happy with for the clocking, but uh, that's only relative to the RTX series. I would say overall, I'm a little bit disappointed on overclocking capabilities. I hope that this weekend, once uh, Joe and I do some work with potentially modding the cards a little more, that we'll, we'll discover there's more room to scale. And hopefully that would imply that the later video card launches will be more capable. But from what we know right now, NVIDIA did not give the board partners a whole lot of time to put these cards together. So it's possible that this is just sort of the low end until we get further later. The Eagle was unfortunately the most disappointing because it didn't have any power offset uh, from 100 baseline. So we didn't have any way to get more power into the card. The VBIOS just doesn't allow it. We're stuck at 100%. EVGAs allowed us to go up to something like 400 watts or approaching thereabouts. And the tough, I think, was in the 370, 380 range, which makes sense for the power, the connectors on it. So it's about where we were. Uh, clocks seem to be not really getting much past 2050, if that. And memory offsets between these three plus the Founders Edition. Uh, we've been hitting, well, I'll just give you all the numbers. We hit 900 offset. We hit uh, 600, we hit 500 offset, and then for the FE, I think it was maybe seven. It might have been six, but it was seven or six to eight, somewhere in there. Um, so that's kind of the recap for overclocking thus far. And uh, I guess I'll give you a really quick walk, walk through of the cards before we like kind of break for the actual reviews. But one thing we talked about in the stream was uh, backplate design. So the tough, aside from having like like the the toy car wheels on it. It also has a hole through here off the side of the PCB where the PCB is truncated. You've got the cooler overhang. Like I said in the stream, this is not new, but it's something you're seeing being enforced more regularly now with the uh, 30 series. So the 5600 XTs and 5700 XTs, especially from Sapphire and PowerColor, some of those had a you know, same thing where heat sink overhang the card, they push the air through and out the other side. And that all makes a lot of sense, but it's we're seeing it more commonly deployed for NVIDIA now. Uh, otherwise, it's a pretty pretty standard card, just a, a shroud. It's black and uh, it's a rectangle. Very simple for this one. For Gigabyte's card, uh, they do have one smaller fan off to the side. This is an approach. Gigabyte's been kind of screwing around with the fan sizes for a few generations. They used to do a different size middle one that was smaller, and then kind of overhang them and inset this one more. This time, that one's the smaller fan. It truncates this part of the board which would be useful if it had an NVLink connector over there, but it doesn't. Maybe that'll be a 3090 thing. They can save some cost. And uh, same hole in the back plate. Air will go through there, stuff like that. Um, I don't... Uh, there might be some thermal pads in there, but we'll figure it out in a teardown. I was going to say, I don't know that they're fully leveraging the space they have. Um, it is just a large gray brick, so... I mean, how you feel about that? There's nothing really flashy about it, I guess, is the point. Then the EVGA card, well, this one's probably been the single most polarizing design on the internet. Uh, it makes very good use of space where the shroud is not coming down past the fins, so the air can get out of the fins still. Uh, you don't have a shroud containing that exhaust like you did on the XFX thick cards or like the uh, Founders Edition 20 series cards from NVIDIA. So they've done the shroud design well where it minimizes the impact of the, the negative cooling impact from it. It does have a massive fin stack. It's all the way across the board. There's not a gap in the middle, really, like the others. Uh, back plate isn't leveraging its surface area, its um, flow through as much as some of the other cards, but how much that matters, we'll tell you in the reviews. And, oh, I've actually just noticed this. It has a um, an auxiliary fan, a four pin connector on there, so you can make the four pin follow the GPU fan speed. Kind of nice sometimes, not something we use in, in what we do normally, but that'll be it. That's the overview for the cards, the overclocking. The stream archive is on the channel if you're interested in it. The last hour to maybe hour and a half, I was trying to keep up with Super Chats and answer them. 
Um, we get more than ever these days. I always want to answer all of them because it's important to me. But we cut off the time at one point, and we were like, OK, don't send any more past this time, because we got to stop the stream at some point. So if I missed yours, I'm sorry. It wasn't my intent. Uh, but you know, we've, we, we can't, can't answer the Super Chats forever, because it, it will actually just not stop. So uh, my apologies if we didn't get yours. But uh, keep an eye out for the future streams. We've got more coming up this weekend. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. And we'll see you all next time.